you can support In the Past Lane with as little as $1 a month. Just go to the support page at our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. In the spring of 1882, at a meeting of labor union activists in New York City, a man stood up to put forth a proposal. The besieged American worker, he said, needed a holiday to call attention to his importance to the Republic and to his worsening exploitation at the hands of powerful business interests. Those in attendance agreed, and months later, on September 5, 1882, the first Labor Day holiday was observed, a celebration that included a huge parade of workers. The next year, Labor Day was even bigger, and it began to spread to other cities. In 1894, Labor Day, a tradition born of the turmoil of the Gilded Age, became a federal holiday. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... So huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 54, in which we complete our three-part examination of the Gilded Age by looking at the ways in which Americans like Henry George and organizations like the Knights of Labor responded to the problems that emerged in that period. We are coming to you this week from the Progress and Poverty Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. The maven of the mixing board is our wonderful executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So what's happening at In the Past Lane this week? Well, my college is on spring break this week, which is always a welcome respite from the demands of the semester. I still have plenty to do this week, but none of it, I'm pleased to say, involves teaching classes, grading papers, or attending meetings, especially the attending meetings part. Probably a good two-thirds of what I'll accomplish this week is related to the podcast. I've got some terrific episodes coming up, including conversations with Ann Bailey about her new book, The Weeping Time, that tells the story of the largest slave auction in U.S. history that took place in 1859. I'll also speak with Ed Ayers, who some of you probably know from the great history podcast, Backstory. He's just published a new book titled The Thin Light of Freedom, The Civil War and Emancipation in the Heart of America. And starting next week, And this time, I really, really mean it. I know you've heard me mention this before in the past. You'll see the first installment of our new weekly feature, The Pit Stop. These will be five-minute pieces that tell you what happened in history this week. Okay, let's get to our main feature. But first, three quick requests. Please consider supporting the podcast by visiting our support page. There you can find a Patreon button or a PayPal button. Your support helps us pay some of the expenses associated with producing this podcast. Please subscribe to the podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you access your podcasts, and leave a starred review. And please help us build our listening community by telling your friends about In the Past Lane and giving us a shout-out on social media. Thanks. Okay, people, grab those protest signs and put on your marching shoes. Your journey in the past lane begins now. In the first episode of this three-part look at the Gilded Age, we examine the aspects of the era that thrilled and amazed people. All that new technology, westward expansion, and a booming industrial economy. These and other features of the last third of the 19th century suggested that it was indeed an age of gold. But in our second episode, we explored the reasons why many people found the Gilded Age a deeply unsettling period. They argued the gold was a mirage, or at least a facade. It was just a thin layer of gold that covered the roiling social unrest being driven by increased inequality, rising poverty, record numbers of strikes, and the emergence of powerful corporations run by men they called robber barons, 
In this episode, the final one in the series, at least for now, we take a close look at the way Americans began to respond to the problems that emerged in the Gilded Age. So let's start with an important clarification. Historians like to name periods in history, and we'd like to argue about them and question their legitimacy or the established beginning and end points. And this tendency to name historical periods is reinforced by the people who write history textbooks, including yours truly. I always remind my students that history doesn't happen in chapters. The U.S. didn't fight a civil war in the 1860s, then get about the business of Reconstruction, then move on to westward expansion, and then plunge headlong into industrialization and urbanization and mass immigration. All this stuff is happening at the same time. Reconstruction is happening at the same moment that the nation is expanding westward, industrializing, urbanizing, and all that. Chapters and periodization are necessary evils. They help us focus on particular historical developments. But we always need to remember that many historical developments unfold at the same time. And so it is with periods of history known as the Gilded Age, roughly 1870 to 1900, and the Progressive Era, roughly 1900 to 1920. I often summarize these two periods by saying, the Gilded Age is when many new social problems emerged, and the Progressive Era is when Americans responded with a vast and varied array of reforms that addressed those problems. This neat little summary can help us see the zeitgeist of each period. But, truth be told, it's a huge oversimplification. And one of the goals of this episode is to complicate our understanding of the Gilded Age by examining the many reform movements that emerged in this period that challenged the power of big business, tackled poverty and inequality, and pushed for a revitalization of American democracy. All this before the dawning of the Progressive Era around 1900. So before we dive into this exploration of the ways that Americans mobilized in response to the social, economic, and political challenges that emerged in the Gilded Age, let's step back to place this effort in the wider context of American history. Essentially, what you see throughout much of the Gilded Age is wide agreement that something is wrong or at least that there are troubling trends in American society that require solutions. But there's no agreement about precisely what to do. Ultimately, what occurs is a profound reordering and redefining of key elements of American political culture. In its simplest form, it went like this. Back in the late 18th century, the founders agreed that the greatest threat to liberty was power, and the greatest source of power in any society was the government. And governments, they believed, always tended towards tyranny and the trampling of people's rights. But you still need a government. So the solution was to create a republic with as weak a government as possible. Liberty would flourish so long as the power of the government remained minimal and decentralized. And this made sense in a small agrarian nation. Now let's jump ahead a century to the Gilded Age. American political culture is still wedded to the idea that power threatens liberty. But now, the greatest source of power is not the government. It's big business. In a word, Men like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie possessed extraordinary power, and they were using it to bend the political system in their favor, over the needs and rights of everyday Americans. Their power was far beyond anything the Founding Fathers could ever have imagined. It's in this context that in the Gilded Age, a consensus began to emerge that in an era of extraordinarily powerful business enterprises and the men who operated them, government was viewed less as a threat to Republican liberty and more as the one institution that could protect Republican liberty. The government needed to be strengthened to rein in the power of big business, and more broadly, to address problems like poverty, ignorance, and poor health. This notion of a stronger state, in the service of the people, is the core idea of what's known as social democracy or progressivism. And it was catching on, not just in the U.S., but also in every other industrializing society in the world in the late 19th century. So how did this idea catch on in the Gilded Age? One source of this popularization of progressivism was the work of intellectuals, people who wrote books and gave speeches that tried to do two things. One, diagnose the source of the problems facing Gilded Age America. And two, provide a prescription or a solution to them. One of the first of these figures to emerge was a man named Henry George. He wrote one of the best-selling books in this period that sought to address the problems that plagued Gilded Age America. So who was this guy? Well, Henry George was born in Philadelphia in 1839, but he moved to California as a young man. And despite having only a sixth-grade education, he became a very successful journalist and editor in the newspaper industry. In the 1870s, a decade marked by a severe economic depression, George grew increasingly concerned over the growth of inequality in America. So in his spare time, he wrote a book on economics, or what in the day would be called political economy. The title of this famous book was Progress and Poverty. 
and it perfectly captured the great dilemma of the period. Why, amid so many signs of economic progress, did poverty increase? Why wasn't everyone benefiting from the roaring industrial economy of the Gilded Age? Why was it that only a select few individuals flourished, like William K. Vanderbilt or J.P. Morgan? Here's how George explained the problem, using a very fitting image of a wedge used to split wood. He wrote, It is as though an immense wedge were being forced, not underneath society, but through society. Those who are above the point of separation are elevated, those who are below are crushed down. Henry George warned that the very fate of the American Republic was at stake. He wrote, This association of poverty with progress is the great enigma of our times. It is the riddle which the Sphinx of Fate puts to our civilization, and which not to answer is to be destroyed. For Henry George, the answer to this riddle was rising monopoly power. By monopolizing land, resources, and large sectors of the economy, rich and powerful interests were becoming richer and more powerful. As they did, they became more powerful than democratically elected leaders. In effect, they became a new American aristocracy, every bit as privileged and entrenched as that in Europe. As for the working class and middle class, they found themselves cut off from opportunity, left to lead lives of poverty and despair. Henry George's book went on to become a huge bestseller in the late 19th century. Indeed, it's still in print today in many languages. Over time, book sales and speaking tours gathered to George a huge following in the 1880s. Most of his supporters didn't support his solution, the so-called single tax on land values. What they were drawn to and inspired by were the broad claims he made regarding America's Republican heritage and values and the threat that they faced in the Gilded Age. Let's take a look at George's three main points. First, George explained in clear and compelling terms how inequality threatened to destroy American democracy. Now, this was a message many prominent figures in the Gilded Age, like Andrew Carnegie, did not want to hear. Carnegie and other Gilded Age winners argued that inequality was not a problem. The free market, they claimed, would provide enough for all who were willing to work hard, make sacrifices, and play by the rules. But Henry George dismissed these kinds of blithe assertions as naive. Inequality was produced by structural flaws in the economy. And if unchecked, it would inevitably Europeanize the United States. It would transform the Republic into a Dickensian nation of haves and have-nots, a society where a small cadre of aristocrats lorded their power over the impoverished masses. George wrote, in our time creep on the insidious forces that, producing inequality, destroy liberty. Now, a lot of people dismissed the idea that economic inequality was a problem. They held to the idea that the republic would be fine because everyone in America enjoyed political equality. They said things like, a steel worker and his employer, say Andrew Carnegie, each possessed one vote. Therefore, they had political equality. But Henry George declared that political equality alone was no longer sufficient to ensure Republican liberty in the modern age of factories and wages. Here's what he wrote. It is not enough that men should vote. It is not enough that they should be theoretically equal before the law. They must have liberty to avail themselves of the opportunities and means of life. In other words, there was an economic dimension to Republican citizenship and democracy. Social reforms had to be enacted to ensure that all people enjoyed a decent standard of living. Henry George's second point was a call for a renewed commitment to the common good. As in the early 21st century, where Ayn Rand and libertarianism have enjoyed a boom in popularity, the Gilded Age saw wealthy and successful Americans celebrate individualism as the supreme Republican ideal. Now, Henry George was no socialist, and he acknowledged the importance of individualism. But he also argued that there were other Republican ideals, like the common good, that simply could not be ignored. Promoting the common good, argued George, was especially important in a modern industrial society, where people's lives were increasingly interconnected. In such a society, wrote George, quote, the well-being of each becomes more and more dependent on the well-being of all, the individual more and more subordinate to society. A true Republican society was one in which the greatest number of people had access to good jobs, decent wages, humane housing, and effective schools. As Henry George said, quote, we all might have leisure, comfort, and abundance. And finally, George's third point, he argued that the government needed to be empowered to enact measures that would reduce inequality and promote the common good. George acknowledged that the Founding Fathers believed limiting government power was essential for the preservation of Republican liberty. But he contended that Madison, Jefferson, Washington, and the others thought as men living in a small-scale rural society. In that context, it made sense to have a weak government. But now, a century later in the Gilded Age, 
the U.S. was a modern industrial society. And in that context, a weak, laissez-faire government was no longer appropriate. A weak government allowed the greedy and unscrupulous heads of massive corporations and banks to oppress the people. To stop this dangerous trend, the power of the government needed to be increased to protect and promote democracy and Republican ideals. For Henry George, this meant instituting his single tax idea. But understood more broadly, Henry George, along with many other progressive thinkers in this period, was helping to make the case that the government was no longer a threat to liberty. Government was liberty's protector. As George's popularity soared in the 1880s, he gained a particularly strong following among American workers. They read his book aloud in their places of work and at labor union meetings. Many also read it in serial form in various newspapers and magazines. And what they liked about the book was its vivid explanations of what was going wrong in the United States and why they, workers and farmers, were working harder than ever before but still falling further and further behind. In particular, they liked how he explained that their poverty was the result of unscrupulous monopolists and bankers, and not due to their own failings. Here's how one worker put it. Henry George's message came to the weary and heavy laden as a talisman of a lost hope. All their lives long, they had been taught that poverty was a dispensation of providence, needful to keep them humble and teach them patience. But, if cheerfully born, it would somehow contribute to their happiness in the dim beyond. Progress in poverty reversed all this teaching that poverty is an artificial condition of man's invention. Working men and women, learning all this, commenced to wrestle with their chains. This wrestling with their chains line referred to the surging labor activism of the 1880s. The best known and most powerful union was the Knights of Labor. It was actually a union of unions. Hundreds and hundreds of unions, big and small, all across the country, united under one banner. Their slogan captured the spirit of solidarity, that lay at the heart of the movement. An injury to one is the concern of all. The Knights of Labor had been founded in 1869 in Philadelphia by a small group of tailors. Originally, it was a secret organization because the workers feared their employers. But secrecy and a severe economic depression in the 1870s sharply limited the growth of the Knights of Labor. Nonetheless, by the late 1870s, the union had several thousand members. And in 1878, the Knights drew up a constitution that neatly summarized their philosophy and goals, among them securing for workers, quote, a proper share of the wealth that they create. Also, equal pay for men and women, the establishment of the eight-hour workday, and abolition of prison and child labor. In the early 1880s, the Knights ended their policy of secrecy and came out into the open. Membership soared, especially after the Knights won several high-profile strikes. By 1886, the Knights of Labor boasted a membership of more than 700,000, making it the largest labor union in the world at the time. And that's the year, 1886, that Henry George's popularity reached its apex. Not coincidentally, 1886 was one of the most tumultuous years in American history. It was rocked by hundreds of strikes and massive demonstrations for reforms like the eight-hour day. But there was one event in particular that stood out amidst the turmoil of that year the Haymarket bombing on May 4, 1886 in Chicago. A labor rally organized by anarchists that day had gathered in Chicago's Haymarket Square. As it began to break up, a large squad of Chicago police moved in. Suddenly, a bomb landed among them and exploded. The blast and the ensuing panic left seven policemen dead or dying, along with six workers. In the aftermath, anti-union businessmen, Politicians and editors seized upon the bombing as an opportunity to denounce all organized labor, a sentiment that was captured in the hysterical headlines in newspapers all across the nation that proclaimed that revolution was at hand. In the New York Times, for example, the headline read, Anarchy's Red Hand, Rioting and Bloodshed in the Streets of Chicago. The article that accompanied this headline claimed, quote, The villainous teachings of the anarchists bore bloody fruit in Chicago tonight and before daylight at least a dozen stalwart men will have laid down their lives as a tribute to the doctrine of anarchism. Chicago police soon arrested eight men, all self-proclaimed anarchists, and charged them with murder, even though there was no evidence connecting them with the bomb. The drama of their subsequent trials and eventual convictions and executions would dominate the headlines for the rest of the year. But anti-labor forces were not content with simply denouncing unions. They wanted to destroy them and the fearful atmosphere after Haymarket seemed to provide the ideal opportunity. So in the spring and summer of 1886, all across the nation, public officials began to jail labor leaders. 
In New York City alone, over 100 labor leaders were jailed for calling strikes and leading boycotts. In response, workers in more than 200 cities and towns across the United States formed labor parties and ran pro-labor candidates for office. Of all of these contests, the most closely watched race was in New York City, where a newly formed United Labor Party nominated none other than Henry George as its candidate for mayor. The ensuing campaign was one of the most remarkable in the city's history. At first, the city's Democratic and Republican Party officials laughed at the fledgling Labor Party. Previous Labor Party candidates in years past had never garnered more than 500 votes. But the laughter of the party bosses soon turned to panic as it became clear that the labor revolt was real and support for Henry George was rising fast. Weeks of extraordinary grassroots campaigning by George and his supporters culminated in a huge parade on the evening of Sunday, October 30th, 1886. Tens of thousands of spectators lined the sidewalks of Lower Manhattan to witness a so-called monster parade of some 30,000 workers of every rank, skill, and ethnicity, marching in support of the insurgent political campaign. They had turned out in response to the United Labor Party's announcement that this was a time to secure, quote, equal rights, social reform, true republicanism, and universal democracy. Then, just a few days later, Henry George stunned the city and the nation by garnering more than 68,000 votes and finishing second in a three-man contest. He actually outpolled a young Theodore Roosevelt, who finished third. At that moment, George, labor activists, and Knights of Labor leaders believed they were on the verge of a revolution in American politics. It seemed certain to them that the hundreds of labor parties that formed in 1886 would coalesce into a national third party that would challenge the Republican Democratic parties they believed were in the pockets of big business. This new party would fight for the interests of everyday American workers and farmers, enacting reforms like the eight-hour day and the regulation of corporations and banks. But alas, both the Labor Party insurgency and the Knights of Labor fell apart in the coming years, done in by infighting and anti-labor efforts by business, political leaders, and the courts. And yet, the spirit of popular insurgency in the Gilded Age didn't die. Instead, momentum for reform shifted from cities and unions to rural America and farmers. Ever since the 1860s, American farmers had been organizing and engaging in political activity to force the passage of legislation that would regulate corporations like banks and railroads that they believed were causing them financial hardship. One of the most well-known of these activists, who increasingly called themselves populists, was Mary Elizabeth Lease. She was from Kansas, where she experienced firsthand the struggles of the American farmer. Mary Elizabeth Lease became an active member in a growing farmer's movement and emerged as a fiery and inspiring speaker. Her most famous line was that American farmers, quote, ought to raise less corn and more hell. By 1890, two large farmers' alliances, sort of like farmers' unions, united into one national alliance that had a combined membership of more than 5 million. That summer, Farmers' Alliance delegates gathered in Ocala, Florida, and drew up a manifesto listing their grievances and proposed reforms. A few months later, in the fall of 1890, Political candidates backed by the Farmers' Alliance swept to victory at the polls in 12 western and midwestern states, winning complete or partial control of their state legislatures and electing six governors. They also sent 50 pro-farmer representatives and three senators to Congress. These impressive results convinced many Farmers' Alliance activists that they needed to form a third party and run a slate of candidates, including a presidential nominee, in the upcoming 1892 presidential contest. So they held a convention in St. Louis in early 1892 that led to the formal creation of the People's Party. This convention also adopted a preamble to the party's platform that captured the mood of despair then gripping workers and farmers. Its language, imagery, and the concerns it raised were very similar to the rhetoric of Henry George and the Knights of Labor. Here's the most famous passage. We meet in the midst of a nation brought to the verge of moral, political, and material ruin. Corruption dominates the ballot box, the legislatures, the Congress. The people are demoralized. The fruits of the toil of millions are boldly stolen to build up colossal fortunes for a few, unprecedented in the history of mankind. And the possessors of those, in turn, despise the republic and endanger liberty. From the same prolific womb of governmental injustice, we breed the two great classes, tramps and millionaires. The People's Party Convention gathered in July 1892 and nominated Union Army veteran James B. Weaver for president and Confederate veteran General James G. Field of Virginia for vice president. The convention also adopted a platform listing their demands. And these demands fell into three broad categories, 
beginning with several anti-monopoly initiatives, like the elimination of absentee ownership of land and also national banks. The People's Party likewise called for a far greater role for the federal government in regulating the economy to ensure fairness and widespread opportunity, including government ownership of railroads and telegraphs and the creation of sub-treasuries. These would store surplus farm produce during times of low prices and allow farmers to borrow money against it at low interest rates. The platform also called for the adoption of a graduated income tax to make the rich pay a greater share of the tax burden and free silver coinage to increase the money supply and thereby help debtors. Thirdly, the People's Party endorsed several measures to restore to the people their democratic voice in politics, including the popular election of senators and the introduction of the referendum and initiative. The party also attempted to create a national base of support among all struggling people, not just farmers. So the platform also included several planks that expressed sympathy with industrial workers and denounced the use of private armies like the Pinkertons in labor disputes and uncontrolled immigration that led to job competition. In the end, the People's Party was no match for the established parties. Democrat Grover Cleveland won the election with 46.1% of the vote over the Republican incumbent Benjamin Harrison, who got 43%. Yet, the populace polled more than 1 million votes, accounting for 8.5% of the vote. Their candidate, James B. Weaver, won the states of Kansas, Colorado, Idaho, and Nevada, garnering 22 electoral votes. And results on the local level were even more impressive, as populists elected 1,500 candidates to state legislatures, three governors, and five senators and 10 representatives to Congress. Not surprisingly, the People's Party had high hopes for the election of 1896. But those hopes were dashed when Democratic candidate, the dynamic William Jennings Bryan from Nebraska, made the silver question his top issue, thereby garnering support from the ranks of would-be People's Party voters. The People's Party nominated Bryan as their candidate as well, but he lost anyway. But while the People's Party soon disappeared, much of its agenda would become law during the Progressive Era, including the popular election of senators and the graduated income tax. And the same is true regarding the goals of the Knights of Labor. All across the country in the Progressive Era, States passed laws to make workplaces safer, to establish workmen's compensation programs, and to outlaw child labor. And many of these reformers in the Progressive Era had one thing in common. They had read Henry George's book, Progress and Poverty, and become convinced that the government had an obligation to enact laws that would promote the common good and limit the power of big business in the name of preserving and expanding American democracy. In other words, many of the significant reforms adopted during the Progressive Era had their origins in the Gilded Age. The reform movements of the Gilded Age, and those that followed in the Progressive Era, remind us of two very important things about the United States. First, that there are two competing ideals in American political culture, individualism and the common good. Ever since the colonial period, Americans have wrestled with their commitment to these competing ideals. On the one hand, Americans have always celebrated and revered the idea of individualism, the notion that a person should enjoy maximum freedom to pursue their own self-interest. But on the other hand, Americans have also celebrated and revered the ideal of the common good, the idea that it's in our interest to enact laws and policies that provide opportunity, empowerment, and protection for large swaths of American society. These ideas are not opposites. We don't need to choose between them. Much of American history has been marked by efforts to find the right balance. How can we adopt laws and policies that will allow a great deal of individual freedom while also upholding and promoting the common good? How can we, as people asked in the Gilded Age, allow the capitalist sufficient freedom to operate his business, while also ensuring that his employees work a reasonable number of hours in safe conditions to earn a living wage? Reformers in the Gilded Age looked around and saw that the pendulum that swings between individualism and the common good had swung way over to the individualism side. And so they launched reform efforts to move that pendulum back in the direction of the common good, towards something closer to an even balance. And that effort to strengthen the common good was renewed in the 1930s with the New Deal and in the 1960s with the Civil Rights Movement and the Great Society. The second thing that these reform efforts in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era remind us about is that virtually everything that we cherish in the United States, and I don't mean many things, I mean pretty much everything, every right, every institution, every law that we cherish is the product of struggle. None of our laws, institutions, and rights fell from the sky. They were fashioned by the hard work, sacrifice, and vision of Americans who organized and marched and fought to push the nation to live up to its ideals, to get closer to the ideal that all men and women are created equal and are endowed with certain unalienable rights. In the Gilded Age, Americans like Henry George and Mary Elizabeth Lease and many others looked past the gold and glitz 
and saw problems they believed were moving the United States away from its ideals of liberty, democracy, equality, and justice. And so they launched reform movements to force their nation to live up to those ideals. Well, citizens, we've reached the end of this episode of In the Past Lane. Thanks for listening. Let me know what you think of this episode and this podcast. Send your comments, questions, and suggestions along via Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Please also leave a starred review, even just a sentence or two, at Stitcher, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. Reviews are really helpful for attracting new listeners. Thanks. If you want to learn more about this episode's topic, you'll find it at our website, inthepastlane.com. There you'll find a show page that has recommended readings, links, and show credits. Thanks to all the terrific people who make In the Past Lane possible. Thanks also to the Free Music Archive, which supplied most of the music for this episode. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world, so let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, are we getting more snow tonight? How the fuck should I know? Ask Siri. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 